at 12 o'clock midnight tonight with us here on Thames, another mysterious tale, courtesy of our friends over there at the Hammer House of Horror. That's at 12 o'clock midnight. First, though, another in the series, Promises and Pie Crust. Now we come to the promises and the priorities of the 80s, the here and now, which provides the baseline for future plans. The 1980s opened with education at a low end. The only government priority seemed to be to cut spending. And for the teachers and other public servants, there seemed to be a prevailing assumption that they were parasites because they were consumers and not creators of wealth. To purge the educational establishment of its remaining complacency, a new hardline Secretary of State was needed. And the man chosen to do this, and who went on longer than anyone before him, was Sir Keith Joseph. I'd always wanted to be at education. I've long been concerned over the, the poor deal that a very substantial, very substantial indeed, minority of our children get. They seem to, they seem to have got no benefit at all from 11 years of compulsory education, either in preparing for life or for citizenship or for work, and certainly not in terms of academic achievement. And I think one of the services I've done is to put that subject of standards and expectations very high on the agenda indeed, and if I may say so, quite right too. Well, that's one of the things you've achieved. Now, where do you think things went wrong? Oh, I'm sure that a, a better tactician could have persuaded the teachers to cooperate more easily in the bargain that was being offered. More money for, for conditions, for a much better career prospect, for appraisal, and much more in-service training. And I, I opened up all the subjects. I hope my successor will achieve them but I did it without winning the goodwill. Do you have any personal regrets of five oh, years? Oh, of course, I'd like to have done that. My purposes were very benign, but I was seen as a sort of devil. But if that's going to play a part in achieving the improvement of expectations and standards for the children, it's a small price to pay. Sir so Keith's passion for high standards started here at Harrow, but now he had to get this across to the state schools. At the top of his agenda, he put making the teachers more efficient and changing the exams, and all this became entangled in a long-running dispute with the teachers. But were these the top concerns of the local authorities which run the schools? They vary enormously in character and in their response to the government's lead. Standards of performance in the schools vary enormously too. Conservative Harrow is the prosperous North London suburb which boasts the best examination results in the country. Something like 40% of Harrow students get 5 O levels, whereas the national average is only about 25%. It's very difficult to make generalisations across a whole borough, but in general, the intake of the school would tend to be what most people would describe as middle class. A lot of our parents are professional people. They seem to have an attitude whereby they value education, their children value education. It is a good thing in itself. So. Your first task then is to read each other's homework and then start to work on it. Swap your work around. Our parents and ourselves don't have any conflict in what we expect children to do in school. Do you reckon the morning? This is good. It's about people sort of in the class now. That's good. The parents expect their children to come home with homework. Parents are helpful to children 
at home with their work. Read mine, see if it goes with yours. We get given homework diaries, and this is our homework timetable. Each night, this is the subjects we have to, we are given by the teachers. And your parents have to sign the parent signature about the homework, and the teacher has to sign it also. It can get embarrassing if you've got like a red mark in your book saying so and so didn't hand his homework in. So you think your mum and dad will tell you off because you didn't hand your homework in. It can be embarrassing. So. So the schools can rely on parents to keep the pressure on children and reinforce the work ethic. It's one of the secrets of success the world over. Are Harrow parents particularly ambitious? Yes, I think all parents want their children to succeed. We all do. I think in Harrow, it's a high ability area and a lot of parents think no further than the standard 3A levels, which is fine if you're intending to go to university. But we have to face the fact that most of our children are not going to go to university. And I would like to see courses more suitable, more suitable for employment. Harrow is caught up in a reorganization of post-16 education. Opportunities for vocational courses will be extended, but academic standards will remain high on the agenda. But the totems of middle-class success are not the only priorities in Leafy Harrow. The suburban landscape hides other concerns, like multicultural education and children with special needs. Throughout the world, there's a movement to bring children with handicapping conditions of one kind or another into the mainstream of education. The rhetoric of integration comes easily, but to carry it through depends upon resources and on the attitudes of parents and teachers. I've often been told that uh... Uh, teachers uh, wouldn't accept these children, but I've yet to meet one who wouldn't, who hasn't shown uh, a caring, warm attitude towards them. How many more do we need now? Go on then. It's true that some of them are nervous when they know they're going to have a child like this in their class whom, whom they may not have, have had any experience of. They've all been willing to, to learn. Do other parents share this enthusiasm for integration? Well, I think all the parents are, are really happy that the children are in the school. Obviously, it benefits them a great deal to be accepted in a normal school community. And I think they'd all agree that it benefits their own children as well to grow up accepting other children naturally. The commitment is obvious, but it's not something you can legislate for. Integration depends on this kind of conviction. Harrow's large Asian population makes multicultural education another high priority. This group here are working uh, with our language development teacher, Ms. She's working with a group of children in this room today. She's not here all the time because she doesn't have class responsibility. She goes around the school working with various groups of children. And where did it go? To the, the, the children come from a variety of backgrounds, and so we feel it's very important that we value those backgrounds, those things that they bring with them. And we encourage parents to come in and perhaps read stories in mother tongue languages to church groups of children. A story in Gujarati. Salami. But English is the main medium. That's a cherry pie. Cherry, cherry pie. It's a pie with cherries. Um, the development of English is obviously essential. We feel that with English being very much the culture of the host nation, that it's important that they're proficient in that. Eat all those things, and he had a poor tummy. The next day was Sunday again, and the caterpillar just ate one Green leaf. Bunch of bunch of. Oh, bonjour, Ashmi. Bonjour. Ah, c'est le marché. The school reckons that as Britain is part of Europe, all children should be introduced to a European language. Croissant, s'il vous plaît. C'est tout? Oui, c'est tout. Oh là là! Un croissant. Mm -hmm. uh, Omelette de pommes frites, s'il vous plaît. A touch of the nouvelle cuisine. 
Are you two Ah, no. No? Tene a gos, tene a gos. Harrow's approach to multicultural education is low key and uncontroversial. Merci bien. Au revoir, madame. I think the Asian population are not significantly different from the native Harrow population. They want the same things that uh, all parents collectively do. They want their children desperately. They want their children to succeed. And they want to make sure they have good schools which help them and don't stand in the way. They think that schools are places to go and learn, not to learn about social engineering and homosexuality and that kind of thing. Would you share their views? Yes. Driving away, you feel Harrow provides the educational environment Sir Keith Joseph understood. A flourishing suburb with flourishing schools. No conflict here with the government's education priorities. Ten miles down the road in Haringey, priorities are very different. Poverty, unemployment, family instability, poor results and poor morale in the schools. Labour Haringey puts equal opportunities top of its agenda. With a large black population, this means anti-racism. The head of this school is himself an immigrant from East Africa. About half the children come from uh, whose parents have been born uh, overseas. And there are about 18 languages spoken. Teachers speak about 16 languages. So it has wealth in uh, knowledge, wealth in artifacts, and uh, wealth in the culture itself. Yes, what's this? Well, Mr. Mann uh, comes from Punjab and he speaks about six languages. English is his fourth language. And Mr. Mann has vast knowledge of different types of food. Andrew, what's that? Ginger. Luke, what is this? Garlic. Garlic. And looking at the whole geography, drawing it, where does it come from? Who grows it? How is it grown? was the texture, developing a language from the reality, from touching. Other hot countries, you see? And here I'd like to echo Dylan Thomas's uh, writing, that if you wipe away the reality of my feelings, my own experiences, how can I experience the experiences of others? Give me a bigger one. How about blindfold bread tasting to learn how the other half eats? What was it? As a child, I grew up in Kenya. Um, I knew, or so I was told, where not to go, you, not to use certain hotels, not to use certain toilets even, and not to go in certain streets. And I knew my place. I, we never questioned it uh, as a nation family. And uh, when I first came to Britain and when I arrived at Victoria Station, I felt, gosh, I must ask myself why and I've never stopped asking why. And that's what I want children to ask. Why? Why am I doing it? What am I doing it for? What will it do to me? More black teachers is the key to multicultural education, but that takes time. A secondary school like Gladesmore can't wait. It's already a multicultural community, and it must offer equal opportunities to all its members. In labs and classrooms all over the country, black pupils are underperforming. Haringey blames racism. Multicultural education, they say, is not enough. How different is anti-racist education? The essence of multicultural education is that it's uh, telling young people about the nature of our diverse society. Anti-racist education is based on values, really. It's on the value of justice, that a school system should be trying to induce young people to believe in that and to fight against injustice. Well, I think the community school has made um, the pupils aware that a school is not just a, a distant, far place where you just gain qualifications. Members of the sixth form have certainly collected the school's values along with their A-levels. We learn to help each other and understand about um, other people's cultures and learn to integrate very well. I feel that there are conflicts in school. I mean, people, it's part of school life, really. You, you always tend to argue, but we never fight about things like cultures because we have a respect for each other's culture. And um, that isn't a subject that we really argue about. It's a subject that we discuss, but not argue about. There is an argument that uh, all people coming to any country should in some way be assimilated and become like the people in that country. The, tr the trouble is it takes two to uh, achieve that. 
uh, people who've been born in this country are still um, asked the question, where have you come from? They're easily identifiable, they're visibly different. And it's very difficult for them to be assimilated, even if they wanted to be, and even if that was thought to be desirable. Is that just a temporary phenomenon? No, it's not a temporary phenomenon, because it's something which is occurring in, uh, has occurred in Liverpool with uh, people who've been in this country for 200 years, generations back, and they're still discriminated against directly by employers on grounds of their skin colour. You say go. The pity of it is anti-racism can lead to witch hunting, a sport too many people enjoy. But Haringey's radical aims are quite consistent. How do they rank their priorities? I think we're particularly concerned that we implement our priorities on equal opportunities in terms of class and gender and race. Traditionally, working class children have not had a fair chance, women have not had a fair chance, and black people have not had a fair chance. We would like to change that. One way is by funding women's groups and black groups which set up collectives to take matters into their own hands. The Women's Training and Education Centre aims to provide courses in science, technology and technical skills, supplementing what it gets from Haringey with money from the European Social Fund. Who is eligible to come? Basically the women who wouldn't otherwise have access to those courses in the normal institution or educational institutions. What priority groups do you have? Priority groups is basically for working class women uh, and then within that working class group uh, particularly for black women and other women from the minority communities. Uh, then we also give priority to single mothers, priority to lesbian women, priority to um, women with disabilities. Can you tell me about this course? Well, it's a women-dominated course. It's just for women only um, to teach them trades that normally they can't get in because they're women, i.e. plumbing, carpentry, electronics, whatever. Um, so why did you decide to do it? It's a good skill. Um, do you hope to be a plumber? Eventually, yes. What are your chances after you come out of here? Chances are slightly better than before I actually came on the course. Um, at least if I go for an interview as a trainee plumber, I can say, well, I've done 14 weeks or number of weeks at the Haringey Training Centre. How much easier it would be to find a plumber if this male stereotype were broken. But equal opportunities have to start much earlier. Pane, Sylvan, Christopher, Jahan. Rokesby School takes gender very seriously. To start with, they don't call the register boys first, girls second. Tom say. Yes, Michelle. Perhaps. In this school in particular, what's interesting is that never have children said that, oh, this is boys' work or this is girls' work. I've been amazed at how asexual these activities have been with the children who've been working here. And the girls, the achievement, the girls who work and the, the sort of the standard of work that they've produced has just created successes um, throughout the school. Vestigial chauvinism is winkled out. We try not here, for example, to say, um, I want four strong boys if anything needs moving or give girls washing up jobs to do. It's very important for us to realise that a lot of um, our opinions and attitudes and values are passed on to children by the way we talk to them, by the way we react to them. Okay, so we've got to give them about ten minutes, all right? Although cooking has been done for years as a mixed activity in many schools, when it comes to the clearing up, it always seems to be the girls that are doing it. So. I feel that teachers have to positively intervene. Unregenerate sexist attitudes are being tidied away in a great many schools with more or less enthusiasm. It's one thing to try to influence what happens in class. It's much more difficult to prevent the boys from dominating the playground and make sure the girls get fair play. Mrs. Sheridan, the lollipop lady, is up in arms about Haringey's notorious attempt to extend equal opportunities policy to matters of sexual orientation. Its commitment to promoting a positive image of homosexuals. 
Well, I dislike mostly the fact that they are, will portray the positive image as their, their sexual habits as normal and natural, and in my opinion, it is not. Is that your opinion? Do you feel very strongly about this? Very strongly indeed. What grounds? Yeah, it's strong enough to remove my children from school. It's not right, it's not normal, it's not natural, and it's not moral. It's being said that some of the materials which are being used is positively promoting homosexuality. Do you deny that uh, suggestion? Yes, I do. Our aim is not to promote homosexuality. Our aim is to see that everyone has equal chances in life and is not discriminated against whether because they're lesbian or gay or through other reasons. It's a fine distinction. Unfortunately, it distracts attention from more urgent equal opportunity priorities like preschool provision. Haringey's extensive program reaches 80% of three and four year olds. Some get extended daycare at centres like Woodland Park. Tell me about the nursery centre. Uh, we have 80 children here, 70 full time. Their ages range from six months to five years. And what activities do you combine on the one side? Uh, a number of activities. We have activities for small play, large play, outside activities, um, early reading skills, maths, those kind of things. So in fact, it's a nursery school and a nursery? Yes, it's um, a combined centre. It's run by the education department and the social services. So in fact, it means that we have both resources available for us, um, lots of support. But it's not a separate school and a separate centre? No, it's actually all combined together. Um, we, we think that the educational side and the social side, the caring, actually ought to be a combined feature, and we can do that within the centre. And does it work? Uh, yes, to a large extent, I think it does. Um, I mean, we're open from 8 in the morning to 6 at night, and certainly that's what our clients want. It fits very well into a working pattern. I think it's good because we can actually combine social service and education. They've got a lot of resources and a lot of expertise, and to actually get the two sources together, um, it's certainly um, a very good thing. It's, it's a learning environment for both of us. Giving children a head start is one educational strategy which research has shown to work. And it makes excellent sense to set up a special committee for the under sevens. But we are in a society now where there are a number of women, and it is usually women, although there are some men, who are actually bringing up children on their own. That's a reality. There are lots and lots of women carers who are on their own, and they need to have nursery provision to take a job or to retrain, and also another factor, to actually relieve them of some stress, because also they will often be in a position of poor housing, low pay, and the nursery provision that they are able to get really helps them to actually survive and to make their quality of living a, a lot better and their children's quality of living a lot better. And also, I really question whether the Conservative government has a high priority for nursery education. And one of the reasons I say that, two reasons. I mean, for instance, the surrounding uh, Conservative authorities have nowhere near as much provision as we have and also I mean last year when we were rate cap before we were we were told really that perhaps we ought to look at our nursery provision but perhaps there was too much perhaps we could make some savings there um, so I mean I'm really depressed by that because we want to do more we are doing a lot we feel we want to do more there is a lot more to do uh, but we're going to be controlled about how much money we have I think there are a lot of financial problems that areas like Haringey have for example, we are rate capped. Um, our budget for the coming year should be nearer 200 million pounds as a council. The government is saying we should spend 150 million. Um, if you look at what has happened over the past five or six years, the government has taken 100 million pounds away from us. They used to fund over half our expenditure as a council. Now it's little more than a third. And this poses grave difficulties for us in implementing policies and indeed merely keeping going with existing policies. Do you not already spend much more than the average local authority? Yes, we do. And we're proud of this because we would argue we have one of the highest needs in the country and this is recognised by the Department of Education and Science. What would you look to a Labour government do to, to smooth the way for you? I think, first of all, it has to end rate capping and it has to give much more in the way of resources to inner city areas and areas in need like Haringey. There's ultimately got to be a control that's operated mainly through the rate support grant. But the problem is, over the last seven years, about £17 billion has been taken away from the rate support grant. And of course, because education is a substantial spender, it's disproportionately felt the weight of those cuts. 
Now, it isn't easy to make a commitment to restore the cuts, and certainly that's not going to be done in a short period. But the additional resources must be made available, but there have got to be priorities within those additions to resources. Some local authorities have quite different priorities from those of the central government. For example, some are mainly concerned, or seem to be mainly concerned, with race or equal opportunities. While some of the local authority decision makers seem to ignore the needs of understanding the way the democracy of society works and seem to ignore the need to prepare children for self-discipline as a preparation for the world of work in whatever form it comes. I think there's ample scope for misunderstanding between the two. Misunderstanding or wildly differing aims for education. For my part, the contrast between these two near neighbours among North London boroughs, a contrast which could be replicated all over the country, speaks volumes about the present state of the schools and of the difficulties of imposing any uniform national solutions. Or will the issue be forced by the march of information technology? To this, we turn next week. For a copy of the booklet accompanying this series, send a cheque or postal order for £1.50 made payable to TVS to P.O. Box 123, Southampton, SO9 7HH. P.O. Box 123, Southampton, SO9 7HH. The Hammer House of Horror opens its doors to the two faces of evil. We undo the locks in a moment. <laughs>